a civil rights hero in his own right, fighting that fight to give everybody a chance. And today in, in Congress, he leads the fight of that most democratic value, which is the right to vote. And he really is at the forefront of our battle to make sure every American has that right, which is the foundation of our, our democracy. So without any further ado, you know, my close friend, my mentor, Congressman James Clyburn. Thank you.
to go away to South Carolina State College at the time, I thought that I would be following my father into the ministry. In fact, we talked about it mostly all of my life. And I thought, sure, uh, that that would be my direction. However, uh, after about my third year at South Carolina State, having gotten caught up in the sit-ins and going to jail several times, uh, I figured that wasn't working too well. <laughs> so I went home to tell my dad uh, that I had changed my mind, uh, that I thought that I would be taking a different direction from that which we had always discussed. I thought my dad would be disappointed, and I suspect that he probably was. But he never showed it. He simply said to me, well, son, he said, I suspect the world would much rather see a sermon than to hear one. It is with that admonition, with that direction, that commission, if you please, uh, I set out to find my course. And I took that with me to the Congress some 22 years ago. And I tried very hard uh, with all that I do and all that I say for the world to see a sermon in my life and in my service. So I come to you today as a part of that sermon. Now when I received the invitation to come, I was uh, uh, sort of uh, not instructed, but directed uh, to take a look at four passages of scripture uh, in order to lay the foundation for my comments here today. I selected from the four uh, the reading that you heard this morning uh, from Matthew 28. Now there's a reason that I selected that out of the four. Uh, simply because I have always felt, having read and reread the Bible several times, having really been uh, sort of indoctrinated in its uh, teachings, I've always felt that to be one of the uh, scriptures that uh, had great meaning for me. Uh, it has become known uh, to those of you who have studied uh, the scripture as the Great Commission. Now, you heard this morning from the Common English Bible. If you were to read it from King James Version, Revised Standard, or the living word, uh, it would be uh, slightly different. And so you're going to hear a little bit of that today in Jim Pirate's version. <laughs> so what was going on here uh, was uh, the master, after having uh, been resurrected for several days, directing uh, his disciples to meet him for a short meeting in Galilee. And when they got there, uh, the, the, the master shared with them this commission, which I might call gave them a job description. He told them what it is they were expected to do in carrying out his word. And as you might imagine, often when we find so many people trying to uh, make sense or understand exactly what it all meant, it was not long before significant disagreement crop up among the followers as to 
what was really required of them? Was this commission, as some would say, uh, to be taken uh, as a strict construction? That is to say that service would be limited uh, to the expressed word. Well, the interesting thing about all of this is that in the book of Acts, I think in the third chapter of my, my member serves, uh, the, we find that uh, uh, Peter and John uh, saw uh, that in these instructions, in this job description, that they were, uh, they were supposed to be activists not passive followers. In fact, uh, we get a, a simple uh, incident uh, of through those powers that had uh, uh, emanated uh, from the master through them. We find the two of them encountering a beggar who was crippled. And because of his pre-existing condition, <laughs> uh, was not able to work as others. And he made his living vain. Now, he positioned himself near the place of worship, where he knew the followers would be coming. And when Peter and John encountered the beggar, they didn't push him off to the side, they didn't say to him, uh, I uh, do not cater to beggars. What they did, according to the scripture, was they used those powers that had been given to them uh, to pray for and to pass along a blessing to change that beggar's attitude. He was healed. And when healed, he then got in a much better frame of mind uh, to receive the teachings. But in spite of all of that, somewhere around the year 44 in here, we are told that a great division occurred. Many of the followers felt that in order to demonstrate their, uh, their faithfulness, their beliefs, all they had to do was just express it. Say, I believe. That was sufficient. James thought differently. And he sat down to, uh, to write what he thought. And there we get uh, what is my favorite book of the Bible, the book of James. Not so much because of my name. <laughs> but you know, it's such a short book of the Bible. I mean, you could read all five chapters in one sitting and, and feel proud of yourself for having done something. <laughs> but James felt different. James says, no, no, no. Strict construction is not how we are to follow his word. We are to be activists. And he expresses something up there in the second chapter. The second reading you heard today. If your brother or sister comes to you hungry and naked, it's not enough to tell them to go in faith. You feed them and you clothe them because faith without works is there. And I believe sincerely that if James were writing that epistle today, he would reflect a little bit more on what was happening uh, with Peter and John in the third chapter of Acts, and he would uh, probably say, if your brother or sister come to you hungry and naked and sick, it's not enough 
to feed them and clothe them, but you provide them with health care. <laughs> because faith without works is dead. If Ami Vera and I are supposed to carry out those fundamental teachings of the Master, we ought to be using our talents. Irrespective of whether we got fired, he's probably got about fired. The medical doctor, he, he, uh, I just got one. <laughs> My, My wife would probably say I got a little more than one. One of, one of which uh, she would bother to reflect upon. <laughs> but irrespective of how many talents you have been given, we are expected to use them for the furtherance of the gospel. Amen. Some of us preach, some play music, some of us read well. Whatever that talent is, we are told in another part of the book of Matthew, I think, early in the 25th chapter, we are told that if those talents are not used to the furtherance of the gospel, we are subject to lose it, even if you have only one. You may find yourself with none. My talent, my job description, my embarrassed job description is to use our talents to further the gospel. We'll leave it up to Reverend Jones to be the shepherd of this flock. But if you need health care, if you have a pre-existing condition, 